Hi, I'm Nick Malowick, and today on uh, An Evil Mind, a video crime blog from Xenoboats, we're going to talk about Samuel Dashiell Hammett, who was born in 1894 in rural Maryland, raised largely in Philadelphia and Baltimore. But San Francisco has the best claim on him because that's where he worked as a detective for the Pinkerton Agency, and also where he wrote and set the majority of his fiction. He started writing short fiction um, for Black Mass magazine, as we mentioned last episode. Mainly stories about a short, 5'6", overweight, 190 pounds, uh, detective known only as the Continental Op, because he worked for the Continental Detective Agency, much as Hammond did for the Pinkertons. Um, the Op was tougher than he would seem at first thing. His, his size, his high weight disparity, often disarmed many crooks, uh, but only some of it was fat. Uh, just for point of comparison, Philip Marlowe, for example, was 6'1 in 190. Um, but first, let's get, sketch in a few more biographical details about Hammett himself. He worked for the Pinkertons from 1915 to 1922, taking a couple of years out for service in World War I, which he joined relatively late in 1918. However, he served in the Ambulance Corps in Europe, saw combat, uh, as did, for that matter, Raymond Chandler, who, however, was a uh, trench soldier. Uh, serving with the Canadian Armed Forces. We'll talk about him uh, either next time or the time after. Uh, Hammett contracts Spanish flu in 1918 as part of the worldwide epidemic. Spanish flu killed a truckload of people uh, in the late teens and early 20s of the 20th century. And in Hammett, it also led to tuberculosis, which was to plague him for the remainder of his life. Um, between the tuberculosis and disillusionment, Hammett quit the Pinkertons, like I said, in 22. Part of his disillusionment may have come from his work in strike breaking in Montana as part of the Pinkertons' contract with the Anaconda Mining Corporation. This isn't 100% confirmed. It was probably a factor and led in part to uh, Hammett's growing political uh, awareness. Because what happened with that is Hammett becomes a leftist organizer uh, and activist, ultimately after he's done with fiction. Because his last novel is The Thin Man in 1980, sorry, 1934. Um, his first published novel is 1928, Dane Curse. Um, and in 1937, Hammett becomes a full-fledged, card-carrying member of the Communist Party of the United States of America. Uh, this ultimately leads to him doing a little time when he takes the Fifth Amendment several times in front of a federal court in 1951. He is blacklisted by the House on American Activities Committee in 1953, although he doesn't do any time for that. Um, so his writing is compressed into a very short period of creativity. And after that, his illness kind of takes over his life. Um, although there is a brief period of screenwriting duty in Los Angeles, uh, around about the same time as they got Raymond Chandler, around about the same time as the film business got uh, William Faulkner, so 1930s, 1940s, Hammett doesn't take to it as well as either of those two gentlemen who, for their own alcohol abuse problems, don't take to it particularly well. Um, alcohol abuse was also a factor in Hammett's life. Um, one of the things, though, uh, in World War II is that Hammett did re-enlist somehow. Uh, no one's entirely sure how, because as someone who at that point would have been almost 50 years old, who had a severe history of breathing problems, um, he may have gotten into it. One biographer speculates that he, he may have gotten into it because he went in the army again as Dashiell Hammett, not as Samuel Hammett, and they expect that that confusion might have somehow greased the way. There are other theories as to how that happened. Um, but because of his service in both world wars, Hammett, communist though he may have been, is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. Um, he died 
not having completed any fiction uh, in, in almost two decades. He died in 1961 of lung cancer. Um, so his breathing problems increased and, and got him at the very end. Um, Tulip is his last uncompleted novel and it was published as part of the collection The Big Knockover. And one thing about uh, Hammett's collection of short fictions, again, which I believe there were 29, by my count, Continental Ob stories, uh, collected in uh, one volume simply called The Continental Ob, another volume called The Big Knockover, but not completely collected. Now, you don't get all 29 stories in one place until um, a collection simply called The Collected Continental Ob, uh, which you'll see down in links. We'll put a sales link for that because it's an, it's an excellent collection. I own it myself, recommend it highly. Um, there, his, I believe, grandchildren are the ones who finally got with the lawyers and straightened out all the rights issues that have to do with this. Lillian Hellman, the playwright, who was Hammett's lover, uh, guardian, and caretaker in, in the latter years of his life, uh, for some reason bound up the rights of four stories uh, for decades and, and even as part of her will as his literary executor uh, those four stories were still unavailable to be collected until very very recently um, but now you can get all of his stuff in one whack and um, that you know that's a good idea it's a good thing to have the book we're going to talk about today is not The Maltese Falcon, which is Hammett's best known work of fiction. Uh, his second best known, probably The Thin Man, uh, which was the basis for five movies with William Powell and Myrna Loy. Of course, the bit of trivia is that the thin man, the titular thin man of the book, is the scientist who is the murder victim in the book and not Nick Charles, the actual detective in the book although that's who it became for the film series. So, Red Harvest. Um, it's never been filmed exactly as itself. It's been ripped off a bunch of times. At one time, rights were bought uh, directly from Hammett and a film made from them that lost a lot of the elements of the book. It was called Roadhouse Nights. It was 1931. But you've seen elements and the basic plot line in many ways in uh, Akira Kurosawa's uh, Yojimbo, Sergio Leone's Fistful of Dollars, uh, elements of it in Miller's Crossing by the Coen brothers, who also took some things from uh, Hammett's novel The Glass Key to make that movie. But in short, here's the plot. A private investigator uh, known only as the op, we never find out his name, works for a large agency called the Continental Detective Agency, gets instructions from his boss, also only known as the old man, and is sent to a town called Personville, uh, but its inhabitants call it Poisonville, for a very simple reason. It's run by an industrialist named Elihu Wilson, who, in order to break a strike, hired several criminal gangs to come in and bust up uh, the evolving union. Problem is, now Elihu's stuck with the gangs, uh, who may or may not have murdered his son Donald, who was a crusading newspaper publisher trying to clean up the town. Um, so the op comes in, his mission, clean up Poisonville. Uh, what this does is sets off at the, largely at the, at the ops engineering, an internecine gang war. And also the cops are totally crooked. He has no allies. He is the archetypal man alone against, you know, a vast uh, criminal conspiracy. So that's basically the book in a nutshell. Uh, you know, why is the book important? Um, obviously, like I said, not Hammett's first novel, but it provides a foundation for, uh, you know, some private eye tropes. And like I said, it, it's been ripped off a bunch of times. Um, although Hammond himself was a communist, uh, Red Harvest, as you know, the name might imply to a certain degree, is read by a lot of people as uh, perhaps a Marxist polemic against, uh, you know, crooked institutions and crooked capitalism. 
and I can see why they think that. Um, there's definitely those elements in there. Um, I don't think it's as heavy-handed as that. And uh, I'll tell you why in a second, but in the service of that, let me, let me give you a hot take of mine real quick. And that is that the Continental Op is an unacknowledged forerunner of James Bond. I've thought this for years. Now, if somebody else has advanced this theory, let me know in the comments. But I think this one might be original to me. and I'm hoping so, certainly. Um, the op works for an organization. And he is responsible only to one man, the way Bond is to M. M gives Bond assignments, sends him off to fight, you know, Goldfinger or Dr. No or whoever. The way the old man gives the op assignments and sends him out you know, to find whatever, you know, whatever crooks there may be out there. <clears throat> the op is unlike a lot of private eyes in that he works for that organization. There's not very many of those. Um, you know, maybe like Joe Gores's novels, and, he, and even the, his characters are only private investigators incidentally. We'll talk about Gores later, uh, I'm sure at some point in the future. Um, most private eyes are lone wolves, not only in the field, but in their, their corporate, uh, you know, endeavors. They, they work for themselves. You know, Spencer owns his own agency. Uh, you know, Sam Spade co-owns an agency with his partner who gets murdered in the Maltese Falcon. Uh, you, you know, uh, Spencer, uh, Elvis Cole, and, you know, any number of fictional private eyes, usually they're, they're working alone, working for themselves. Um, <laughs> hilariously, to me at least, um, you know, in, in the face of failing public institutions like the police, uh, you know, during the, during the Depression, um, Hammett sets up what would be a, an organized private sector response to these problems. You know, he, he sets an organization, uh, you know, to act in the place of, you know, an actual law enforcement agency. Now, you know, I don't think that necessarily fits the best way with, 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 with what I would assume are his, his leftist intentions, given his politics as practiced. Um, you know, the lone wolf works for himself private eye would probably be a lot more likely, but that's not what we get here. We get the op who works for the Continental Agency. Um, and the thing of it is, while the op does clean up Poisonville, he doesn't really solve the problem. Even after he gets rid of the corrupt cops, even after he gets rid of the gangs and lets them kill each other off, Poisonville uh, reverts back to the hands of Elihu Wilson. And, and Wilson was the problem in the first place. Uh, you know, the workers weren't organizing because they thought he was a neat guy who treated them well. So, you know, this cycle is probably going to, you know, reassert itself. You know, he, after the op does his work, the National Guard comes in to take control of the town and act in place of its, you know, of its police force. But uh, Red Harvest made it onto Time's list of 100 greatest books of the 20th century. And rightfully so. If you only read one Hammett, read this one. Um, Maltese Falcon is, is also a good book. Uh, Dane Curse, another one of the op books, that's a good one. Glass Key, uh, all, you know, Hammett didn't write so many novels that he had a chance to write a bad one. But, you know, read this one, read the op short stories if you like them. Like I said, there's a whole, like a now complete collection of those. Um, you know, you, you really can't go wrong with Hammett. He doesn't have any clunkers. Uh, the way that you know some other authors do and if we talk about Marlowe and Raymond Chandler next week we might I haven't decided yet um, there are some low points in that one they're still pretty good overall but man you know Hammett is, is really only active as a novelist for a very short span of years and he really bangs them out so it, it's hard to go wrong on that one uh, but man, man as far as I'm concerned as far as most people are concerned Red Harvest is tops. It's his best one. So you can find it along with many other books, along with my books, in the links below. Please subscribe to our channel. Please sign up for the notifications. Please follow us at Xenobooks on Twitter. And uh, thank you very much for watching this. Any questions or comments, leave them down below. And we will talk to you next week.
Thanks again for your